right, uh, I think we uh, maybe should get on our way. So it's uh, just a little past uh, 7.30. So we'd like to welcome everyone tonight's seminar. My name is Peter Raftopoulos and I'm the president of the Ithacan Historical Society. The committee of the Ithacan Historical Society is proud to support this new initiative of uh, online lectures, which will engage wider audiences in the history of Ithaca and the broader Ionian region from antiquity to more recent times. Future seminars will cover topics as broad as the famous question of the Homeric geography of Ithaca, Heptanesian music, the archeology span of the Venetian period, the art history of the Ionian islands, education in the early 20th century Ithaca and many other topics. Tonight begins the first of three seminars over the remainder of 2021. In November, we will have Dr. Ramina Tsakiri speak on brigandy and piracy in 17th century Ithaca. In our third seminar, Professor uh, Gakis, uh, Sakis Gekas will speak on the British protectorate of the Ionian Islands. Tonight's seminar is on the Libro di Oro of 1803, a very late catalogue of nobility created after the end of the Venetian rule in the Ionian Islands, and a unique document which will reveal the administration of class structures during the period when the islands changed between Venetian, French, and British imperial powers. We'll also see what a rich source of data it is for those searching their genealogies. Our speaker tonight is Kiriako Nikias, a PhD candidate at the University of Vienna, working on ancient Greek legal history, but also works on modern Greek history and literature. Kiriako has Ithacan heritage and his historical interest in the Ionian Islands developed out of an interest in his family's history. He's also a committee member on our Ithacan Historical Society. Following Kiriako's seminar, there will be time to ask questions on tonight's topic. We will take questions from both YouTube and Zoom, and I will let you know how you can do this when we come to discussion time. Before I hand over to Kiriako, just a reminder, please, to keep your Zoom microphones on mute throughout the seminar, if possible, um, and that will help significantly. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Kiriako and, and uh, giving our full attention for his lecture. Thank you so much, Peter, um, and thank you to the Ithacan Historical Society for having me tonight um, and uh, to, for everyone for having joined to listen. Um, here and on YouTube. So the subject of my lecture tonight is to trace the history of the legendary Libro d'Oro, um, the catalogue of nobility through the Venetian period and into the early 19th century, where we will arrive at the 1803 example um, from Ithaca produced under the Septinsula Republic. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. The Zakynthian poet Ugo Foscolo writing in 1817, 20 years after the fall of Venice, reflected that there were three causes for the disunity of the Ionian Islands. The very first he recognized as the class divide. He writes, the everlasting vices of the obnoxious and cowardly Venetian government, being itself imbecilic and in decline, supported itself in its subjugated territories, not so much by the dignity of its own power or by the sanctity of its laws, but by the perpetual division of the people. And the people so divided became weaker than the government itself, and it was therefore easier to oppress them. For the son of an old Venetian family, the poet shows no nostalgia, for the old regime. As we might expect, the distaste for the oppressive class structure was recorded in the popular literature too, in proverbs passed down the generations through the oral memory. Here are a few. If the poor don't starve, the rich won't feel full. One of us does the digging and groaning, and the other one drinks and gets drunk. Master helps master, and nobleman helps nobleman. A friend of a nobleman is either a traitor or a nutcase. These 
proverbs tell of the sense of exploitation by the working peasant against the idle landowner and the sense of impenetrability of class loyalties, those between noblemen, but also the solidarity expected between the masses. The class divide was foundational to modern Ionian society, a condition which had prevailed in various forms since long before the Venetian period and lasted well into the 19th century, where it confronted the British colonists. The British administrator Napier, for example, records the situation he encountered at Kefalonia, where medieval-like feuds between the noble households, such as that between the Arnino and Metaxa families, were perceived as a threat to the British administration. He writes, every village chiefly consisted of a family and generally bears the family name. The peasants all live in villages. No man ventures to live in an isolated house. To mutual defense, every member of the family is pledged. Each village has one or two feudal chiefs whose influence extends over one or several villages. When there are two chiefs in the same village, there are generally two factions. Napier then recounts a quarrel among men in a village, threatening to undermine the colonial administration. He writes, I happen to be at dinner with the Countess Anino, to whom this village belongs. Her answer was that they were to obey the government, even if it demanded their sucking children. The Countess Anino is the greatest feudal proprietor in the island and could at any moment have opposed the government with 4,000 men, end quote. These three examples I have chosen, a writer's reflections, some popular proverbs, and a colonial administrator's observations, serve to show just how profoundly the class divide built by the Venetians continued to segment Ionian society after the fall of Venice. My lecture shall give some indication, I hope, about how these relations of power were negotiated in the first couple decades after the fall of Venice. And in the latter half, I will focus specifically on the documentary evidence of the 1803 Ithacan Libro d'Oro. Venetian rule in the Ionians begins in, at different stages. In Ithaca and Kefalonia, Venice takes control in 1500, but much earlier in Corfu. The intervention of the Venetian state in its new colonies formed new economies and new societies and integrated them into a maritime empire. Agriculture and trade developed around monocultures of olive production in Corfu and Paxos and current production in the south, in Dante, Ithaca and Kefalonia. The growth of trade, the growth in trade in these commodities during the 16th and 17th centuries brought great wealth and led to great inequalities. In the larger islands, tensions developed between, on the one hand, the old nobles being part of the Venetian political establishment, and on the other hand, an emergent bourgeoisie settled in the urban centers with growing wealth from the network of the current economy, yet locked out of the institutions of state owing to the exclusivity of the nobility. Among the key institutions of this Venetian era nobility is the so-called golden book or libro d'oro. In a particular place, being its own legal jurisdiction, the libro d'oro is said to have listed all the local nobility and so defining the legal haves from the have nots and protecting the upper class from the invasion of unsuitable types. Yet the Libro d'Oro remains elusive. One major historian has described it as one of the myths of the nobility. It remains then to be seen what we can understand from the Libro d'Oro in a, in a particular place. In sense. In An identical mythical position is occupied by the term in the historical tradition of Venice proper, to which we must take a detour before we can return to the colonies. Historians have usually located the concept of the Libro d'Oro in certain regulatory practices for the Venetian nobility. And from the Libro d'Oro in a... ...occupied by the term in the historical tradition of Venice proper, to which we must take a detour before we can return to the colonies. Uh, Peter, I think we've got some uh, feedback. Yeah we're, got, yeah, we're getting some feedback. I'll just mute you and keep yourself mute. Historians yeah. have so I'll continue from there, I apologize. 
Historians have usually located the concept of the Libro d'Oro in certain regulatory processes for the Venetian nobility, which were popularly described in the, as a grand noble register of the well-born as a Libro d'Oro. Regulating the Venetian nobility was an important political function of state, since the Venetian nobility, formerly the patriciate, was the politically enfranchised citizenry of Venice proper and sat in the great council pic pictured here, the great deliberative body of state. The patriciate was formed after the serata of the ground of the grand, great council, its closure in 1297, before which it had been more open. The Venetian ruling class was therefore formally a political class, but the patriciate mythologized its political function as a noble service rendered unto the Republic rather than as an obligation inherent to its very constitution. The reality is that the elected offices to which nobles were entitled were a rather attractive way to earn a salary and to support a family. The idea of the Libro d'Oro was part of this process of mythologization. Manuscripts from the Venetian genre of family chronicles like this one shown here were a kind of unofficial Libro d'Oro in this vein. But the reality of the Libro d'Oro insofar as it refers to an official practice is however, rather banal. It's not associated with any glorifying chronicle, but hidden within the rather um, banal administrative procedure, which was developed to record noble births and marriages at the beginning of the 16th century, a function exercised by the office of the Abogadori di Comune, three of whom are pictured here. 27 volumes of the records um, produced during this, under this, um, under this procedure, excuse me, 27 volumes of these records produced under this procedure are held now at the Venetian State Archive, listing those eligible to sit in the Great Council. I apologize, apparently you cannot see my slides, which is a rather, um, which is unfortunate. Let me stop and restart. I apologize for these embarrassing technical difficulties. I've had mostly images um, and I'll show you them um, to recap, but there wasn't too much um, substantive information. So here was, for example, I'm not sure where I last left off. Here is the great council of Venice where sit the patriciate, the, form, the formerly political Venetian nobility. Um, and this is um, an example of what, it, what are called the Venetian family chronicles. So they are kind of catalogues of nobility, but they're unofficial. And they lent into this myth of the Libro d'Oro, um, which I uh, mentioned. And here a nice portrait of an 18th century late Venetian uh, noble family, which kind of has all of the features of the Venetian uh, noble pretensions. It has the ancestry and offspring all uh, represented in one image. Um, and this is the office of the, or these are three um, men in the office of the Avogadori di Comune, who um, were, were the regulators of, among other things, the uh, entry membership to the Venetian nobility. Um, so the increasingly bureaucratic procedures reflected a constant obsession of the Venetian nobility, which were its exclusivity. So the concern at the start of the 16th century was no longer to prevent the entrance of unsuitable types in the form of the lower classes who had been well locked out, but to maintain a particular kind of legitimacy among the offspring of the present noble families who were popping out sons in the hope that they could stack out the vote and win for themselves one of the limited bureaucratic offices together with its salary. The Venetian political, political model and its nobility to some extent appeared in miniature in the colonies. There were councils established on each major island, also Crete, Pel Peloponnese and in Dalmatia. These constituted political, the political community of the local jurisdiction. And while the local eligibility and the local systems for regulation varied, the main 
um, important economic criterion for entry uh, was the requirement to prove that to the official examiners that neither the person being examined, the applicant, or his father or his grandfather had ever worked a mechanical trade and instead lived off unearned rents from the land. But the councils generally followed, followed a similar trend to the development in Venice. The political community began as a more open body, admitting those meeting the requirements and later closed, capping the number of nobles um, and locking out the aspiring members, save for when they could open being examined, the yeah. qualification or the failure of a member to produce heirs, just as in Venice. In Corfu and Zante, and similarly in Crete, new regulatory processes were applied to the membership of the councils in the last decades of the 16th century. And we shall see in a moment the particular case of Kefalonia as we move towards Ithaca. The registers and catalogues established in the late 1500s are the moment the legend of the Libro d'Oro arrives in the Venetian colonial per periphery, not too much later than in Venice itself. Though the term is not used officially by administrators until probably the late 17th century in Venice and the mid 18th century in the islands, at least on the basis of the archival evidence that we have now. In this way, the councils of Dante, Cephalonia and Corfu repeated over just a century or so, a similar process of tightening and regulating, which had taken two or three in Venice. Importantly, the establishment of the councils under the Venetians created a new civic nobility in the islands without being tied to land relations as it was under the feudal system imposed by the earlier Latin rulers. If many old Latin barons did find, the way into their, in, did find their way into the new Venetian nobility, their status was formally independent of the old. And the character of the Venetian nobility was, as in Venice, political and oligarchic and not a feudal hierarchy of proprietary relations. Members of the council were formally called cittadini and constituted the political community of the island. Sometimes the word nobili was used, particularly to distinguish the class from the urban middle class. Considering the Kefalonian case is an important step towards discovering Venetian Ithaca. In the Kefalonian council's first century, the membership criterion was loose and a sense had grown that the composition of the council was unsuitable for government because the members included, to quote the minutes of the meeting of the 25th of March, 1593 shown here, people of every quality, including artisans, tradesmen, and peasants. The Venetian Senate allowed a kind of Kefalonian serata in 1593, and the new council would be restricted to just 180 members broken into regional quotas um, but despite this set out of 1593, the number of members actually grew of this, over the 17th and 18th centuries, which uh, makes the Kefalonian council unique in comparison to the councils at, um, at Zante and Corfu. Um, and this was because major families sought to stack out the vote uh, with loyal members who were probably ineligible for membership otherwise, uh, but who would um, bear their allegiance to a particular clan. And so this actually led to the councils in Corfu and Zante to snub Kefalonian nobles when they were visiting the islands, um, when they tried to exercise their right to sit in the council in Corfu or in Zante. So the, and so the Kefalonian uh, council had a reputation for riotous meetings and family rivalries, its corruption and its uh, inefficacy. Despite this, formally at least, entry into the restricted councils followed a procedure of proofs, not unlike those in Venice itself, to show rightful lineage. These were the esami e prove della civiltà, or prove della nobilità, examinations and proofs of civility or nobility, and they ensured that the administration of the islands stayed among the right kind of people. These two family trees uh, from the proceedings of a 1749 council on Kefalonia revealed the elaborate task of tracing the rightful inheritors as the generations passed on. Little Ithaca was ruled by delegated administration from the cittadini of Cephalonia. Chief among them was the elected Capitano Altiaki. Here we see the election of Nicolò Traulo, Nicola Stravlos in 1593 from the same 
uh, proceedings, those first proceedings as the, those shown earlier. So there was no council in Ithaca and no members of the Kefalonian council from Ithaca. And so there was strictly speaking, no Ithacan nobility. The only exception was for the family Galati who held an earlier noble status under the Neapolitan rulers, the Tocco, um, who had ruled Ithaca um, and the region in the 14th and 15th century before the Venetians. They retained some privileges and exemptions from taxation into the Venetian period, but they were not strictly cittadini, for they were not members of the Council of Kefalonia, um, and their receipt of a, of a higher status was on account of their earlier noble heritage and independent of the new system. Still in Ithaca, just as in the larger neighbors Kefalonia and Zante, there were certainly growing inequalities during the 17th century in particular, though on a smaller scale. In the larger islands, trade with British merchants allowed the growth of a wealthy bourgeois class engaged in current production. And in smaller Ithaca too, as the cultivation of the island developed, so did the opportunity for greater wealth from trade. So while the Ithacan crop was small, the Ithacan current was reported to be of high quality and fetched a good price. The Venetians re had resettled Ithaca in 1504, distributing small parcels of land to settlers from other islands to encourage them to cultivate the land. Whatever the distribution of land at this time, at the time of resettlement, key documents of the mid late 1500s, some decades after, show evidence for the consolidation of land ownership in the decades, in the century following the uh, resettlement. In Ithaca, the administrative apparatus consisted of Kefalonian delegates in the higher offices, but also incorporated some local representatives. To some extent, these may have formed a local elite, which we might speculate would have been occupied by the most gentrified of the richer islanders. That all goes to describe the old regime. This old social order comes to an abrupt end when Venice falls to the Republican French in 1797, proclaiming the arrival of democratic rule and the end of all aristocratic privileges in all the Venetian territories. Identical legends attached to the French arrival in both Venice and the Ionian Islands. They are said to have installed the Tree of Liberty at the Piazza San Marco, and similarly in the squares of Corfu, uh, Zante and Kefalonia. And in the squares, they're also said to have burned publicly the Libro d'Oro. And uh, in this engraving on the right here, we see the four bronze horses once sacked from Constantinople and now, and taken to Venice and now uh, being taken uh, to Paris by the new conqueror. The document on the left, uh, signed by Napoleon Bonaparte himself, decrees that in the Ionian Islands, all feudal land holdings and any other noble privileges were abolished. But this short Republican French rule was brought to an end by a Russian-led mission in 1798. And in, 19, in 1800, uh, a new state was formed under the protection of the Russian Ottoman powers, which encompassed the seven islands. This new state was, was the Septinsular Republic, the Republic of the Seven Islands. It was established under the shared protection of the Russians and Ottomans who were both keen to ensure stability in the contested Mediterranean. The first constitution had a federal and aristocratic character. Each island had a general council which elected representatives to Corfu. On the larger islands, the membership simply replicated the Venetian councils. So the 1800 constitution re-established the old nobility which had been abolished just two years earlier by the French, three years earlier by the French. But the small islands, Paxos and Ithaca, where no Venetian council had ever existed, had somehow to delineate the new membership of this local elite. So this was actually the first attempt at formalizing class structures in these smaller islands. And some Ithacan documents, some very interesting documents survived from this period um, and they have been uh, published in the, un, the well, they have been um, printed in the unpublished manuscript of Athanasios Lekatsas's History of Ithaca. Um, but um, owing to the, the poor quality of the editing and, and the fact that it was an un, unfinished manuscript, um, we really wait until the archive in Ithaca 
uh, reopens until that period can be studied in greater um, detail. The Septentrion Republic's federation had effectively splintered by uh, late 1800. Violence and dysfunction spread after the withdrawal of the Russian troops in July 1801, which had to return in August 1802. The southern islands of Kefalonia, Dante and Ithaca splintered off and made an attempt at self-government, refusing to recognize the sovereignty of Corfu. Dante in particular had declared its allegiance to the British and had raised the Union Jack at the fort in 1801. The island recalling the great riches earned by trade with British merchants and requesting the ambassador in Constantinople, the notorious Lord Elgin, to declare British protection, a request he denied. Social unrest was along class lines. This was particularly violent at Kefalonia, where peasant anger erupted against the old landlords for exacting oppressive taxation. And even at Corfu in 1801, the bourgeoisie together with, together with the peasantry organized to disrupt the Republic's hold on the island and together proclaimed a new representative body which would split power between the old nobles and the bourgeoisie with a small representation even for tradesmen. In Ithaca, the local tensions had made government impossible. The island's allegiances were divided between town and country to the extent that that uh, division had developed. The local population based at Bathi, the capital in the southern harbour, had followed the inspiration of Dante and established itself against the official government led by Nicolaos Bretos, which had to seek support in the northern part of the island, which remained loyal to the new republic. The merchants of Vathi likely felt that they deserved more power and autonomy in the new regime and aligned themselves with the bourgeois in Zante. They even proposed to raise the Union Jack at Ithaca too. Order and allegiance to Corfu was eventually restored with the arrival of the imperial forces to keep the separatist, separatist islands in line. Still, a more stable constitution was sought for the causes of social, social crisis. In 1803, the powers imposed a new constitution at the hand of Count Monchenigo as a proxy of the Russian protective power. The new constitution needed to address these bourgeois concerns that had erupted earlier. This old problem of the Venetian period could be ignored no longer, especially since the bourgeois towns, particularly Zante, had, showed, had shown that they simply would not capitulate to the old power at Corfu. The new liberalizing constitution of 1803 would be clearly bourgeois in character and expanded the power of the merchant class against the old nobles. A letter of 1816 from Plato Petrides to the notorious administrator Maitland reflects that since Mochenigo's intention was, I quote, to lower the intolerable pretensions of the ex-Venetian nobility, he thought the best expedient was that of multiplying the number of those who went by that name. So the new constitution abolished the old nobility and established a new political class, the so-called constitutional nobility. These new constitutional nobles formed the political body of each island called the Sinclito Governativo, the Governing Council, which elected delegates to the parliament in Corfu. While historians have generally insisted on the formal distinction between the old Venetian nobility and this so-called new constitutional nobility, this view itself takes its inspiration for the disgust, in the disgust expressed by the old nobility for the, dis, for the debasement of their titles, owing to the great number of new entrants to the class. To enter the new class, you had to satisfy a new list of criteria which were applied to assess who was and wasn't eligible. Broadly, they addressed three themes, the proper background of an applicant, his economic status and his character. The economic status is the most significant theme here. The applicant must have lived off an income, typically agricultural profits or rent from the land and could not work in a mechanical trade. This was a reform to one of the old Venetian proofs required of nobles, which was to show that one's father and grandfather had never worked a trade. But the new rules of 1803 had shifted the focus merely to the applicant himself and not his ancestors. 
This is one of the defining bourgeois characteristics of the new constitutional nobility. Put in vulgar terms, it was designed to allow new money in. You could be admitted if you had the right amount of income from, say, rent from the land, even if your father or grandfather had, say, worked that very land as a farmer himself. And this was precisely the opposition of the old nobles. The income criterion was set for each island according to the local economic conditions, as we shall see in the tables on the right. Uh, so the Ithacan minimum income is second only to Kithara, and uh, it makes up only about half of the required income for Kefalonia and not 17% uh, for Corfu. This is a very important qualifier on any uh, comparison or equivocation between the nobles of one island and another. And the nobles of Corfu, of course, were the most rich of them all. And we must wonder how many of the Ithacan nobles, if any, for example, would have qualified if they were to pass the test on another island, um, let alone uh, in Corfu. An important exception for the income requirement was allowed for the holders of degrees from what the constitution calls one of the great universities of Europe. This was directed at the inclusion of an educated professional class, almost always the sons of the old nobility and, and the upper bourgeoisie in any case. This in the opinion of the Viscount Kirkball writing at the end of the British period served as, I quote, proof rather of the poverty of the Ionian gentry than any liberality of sentiment. Throughout Phoenician rule, Rich Ionians had set their sons to be educated, usually in law and medicine, at the ancient Italian universities, but predominantly at Padua, in the terraferma, the mainland possession of the Venetian Republic. It's important to note here that the educational exception is not a complete novelty of the 1803 constitution, because even the old Venetian rules allowed those who, who uh, did not live off an income uh, from the land to be accepted to the councils if they exercise certain professions, so they could be lawyers or pharmacists. The real uh, innovation of the 1803 uh, criteria is twofold. First, it is that the lists of nobles who formed the governing and voting synclity of each island, that is the Libro d'Oro itself as a catalogue, wasn't capped. It wasn't limited to a certain number. They could grow over time with the successful proof by new applicants of their satisfaction of the criteria. And we will see this growth appear in the Ithacan Libro d'Oro where we shall finally, finally arrive in a moment. This contrasted starkly with the old regime where the Venetian period nobles scarcely grew in number after the closure of the council uh, to new admissions. And second and equally as important was the central role of the income criterion and the ability for the sons of otherwise suit unsuitable applicants to join the ranks of the pretentious Venetian nobility. In these portraits here are depicted some of the old nobles and new nobles uh, to, to being members of the professional bourgeoisie and the women around them, which help, I think, to illustrate the part of society we are describing. To manipulate the conflict between the old and new money was the very aim of the reforms of the 1803 constitution formed at the hands of the Russian representative in Count Montenegro. Since the tension between the old politically represented nobility and the disenfranchised bourgeoisie was a cause of strife and anarchy the year before, as we saw, as it had been for centuries. A report of 1816 describes the tension between what it calls two classes of nobility and writes that, the new class of nobility established by Mocenigo was built upon a most loose and vague tenure, but which answered Mocenigo's purpose for the moment of lowering the old Venetian nobles and setting up this new and conflicting class of nobility, which as might naturally be expected, is an object of jealousy to the higher class of nobility. And this class is now the only one wedded to all their ancient prejudices and old Venetian habits. These pretensions, I think, are consciously and clearly depict, depicted in some of the portraits here. The mass of these unsuitables, these new entrants in the nobles, old nobles' eyes, lined up to register in 1803 in order to be included in the Liberty d'Oro of the islands. 
As in the Venetian period, the right of the applicant was inherited by his sons, provided they maintained their eligibility. Um, and they, they, they would then exercise that right at the age 25. An adult registrant was usually recorded, therefore, with his sons in anticipation of their coming of age. This is significant because the catalogues known as the Liberty d'Oro were not simply electoral lists, as it has often been put, because they encompassed the entire male population of the nobility. And this is um, an important qualification to the otherwise individualizing theme of the new constitution, because the catalogues were organized according to family units, uh, which were directed at the tracing of hereditary rights. Nevertheless, an important observation, I think, is begged by the absence of women here, that the, the new constitution did not examine the mother's class status. The regulation of the new nobility had two sides. While we know the administrative catalogues known as the Liberty Dono, where there were also official certificates of nobility issued to the registrants. And we have two examples which survive. The first example belonged to Savas Aninos from an important noble family of Catalonia. This document certified that the holder had been successfully examined against the criteria and declared his political right to sit in the Corpo Nobile e Governativo, that is the Sinclito of the island. A comparison with the second example from Lefgada confirms that the documents were more or less uniform, allowing for the variation of um, different island administrators. This second example, also for an old noble, for Count uh, Giorgio Zancarol, uh, shows us how an old Venetian status or title did not mean anything under the new regime. Even an old count needed to uh, prove again his entitlement under the new rules. This offense was great uh, to the old aristocrats and that's why the, the old nobles um, so derided this new constitutional nobility. No other examples of these uh, certificates have been published and um, the obvious fact that they are held in the, uh, they were held by the registrant himself means that their fate um, is decided by the archival practices of the family. Um, and so we can just hope that perhaps one day an Ithacan example might appear. So having seen the uh, individual certificates, we can now move finally to the collective catalogue, the Libro Toro, of which the only published example is the 1803 catalogue made at Ithaca. It was published in 1997 by the former archivist at Bathi Eleni Griba. The document is a book of 75 pages in total, all written in, all written in Italian, still the dominant language of administration. And its first entries are dated the 17th of August, 1803. Generally, one page recorded the registered male members of one family and their descendants. Space was allowed on the rest of the page for the addition of later descendants claiming inherited rights. This was forward planning administrative practice. A handful of entries indeed have later editions, with, where sons who were born later than the original date of registration were added so that they could inherit the right of their elder brothers too. The latest edition dates to 1813, showing the longevity of the Libro d'Oro as a political register, even after the state which gave birth to it had, had fallen um, in 1807. A large amount of editions were also made in 1804, these listed new applicants who presumably either failed the examinations in 1803 or had not applied initially. Here, uh, two families were listed per page in the 1804 editions, and the archivist Griva suspected this was because the record maker knew the pages were, the pages were running out. For an indication of the comparative exclusivity of the new nobility in Ithaca, we need to compare the document with the 1807 census which has been recently published by Ioana Thanasopoulou, um, which gives a full list of every resident of Ithaca with their age. The census gives the island's population at 6,844. And the Libro d'Oro of 1803, together with its 1804 editions, lists 188 family units, containing 624 registered members across them though many of those 624 members uh, had yet to um, come of age. And so um, 
we need to somehow estimate the amount of adult members um, at the time, 18, in 1807, to get a proper comparison. Um, this can formally be done by a complete comparison of the data, um, which remains to be done by research since that is an extensive task. Uh, but I would estimate um, on the basis of uh, the examples that I've looked at, that there would have been about two to 300 active nobles at the time um, in, in this first decade of the 19th century. So with these two or 300 adult nobles, um, that would correspond to about three to 4% of the total population of the island at the time, or about six to 8% of the total male population, allowing for the fact that they're all men. And if we include the full 624 nobles, that is if we include all of the, the children as well, the nobility is 9% of the total population or 18% of the total male population. Now, we don't know if these are inflated or um, uh, irregular statistics because we have no other uh, published example from another island. But I think that this data, these, these um, comparisons confirm the pretensions of the old nobility, that the, the new nobility had thrown open the doors and no longer is the nobility a highly exclusive class. To put things into perspective, the old Venetian council of Dante consisted of just 150 members among a population which had risen to 25,000 in the 18th century. That's just over half a percent. And even if we only take the population of the town capital itself at Dante, the nobles just make up 1%. So the new nobility of 1803 was going by the Ithacan proportions three to four times larger. Even in Kefalonia during the Venetian period, uh, their bloated council was still an order smaller. These, of course, are just preliminary um, comparison. More work, of course, remains to be done, particularly, I think, on the geographical distribution of the new nobles in Ithaca. The 1807 census shows an almost even split between the residents of the northern and southern halves of the island, um, because of course, the, uh, the island's capital, Vathi, had been growing over the 18th century with the expansion of um, merchant trade. And I suspect, therefore, that the merchant class of Vathi would be um, well represented, if not um, a majority, of those recorded in the Liberadoro, perhaps uh, represented second by um, the wealthier landowners in the north. But this, of course, remains to be tested by um, an exhaustive comparison of the 188 families um, in the Liberadoro uh, with the 6,000 residents in the um, census, um, which is an extensive task. So moving back to the document of the Liberadoro itself, I think I will dwell briefly on a few randomly chosen examples which reveal some key features of its content. As a genealogical source, the entries are significant because they usually give three generations, which allow the construction of a tree. And this was significant for the administrators too, because even in Venice proper in the, in the old regime, the proliferation of cousins with similar names posed a problem for administrators trying to work out who was exercising a right, um, who was entitled to a right they were trying to exercise and who wasn't. And our first two examples here are quite boring. Uh, you have simply um, three figures in the first, and in the second, you have two sons. Um, presumably these sons had not come of age, but we would have to consult the census. Um, in this larger example, we have an example of how complicated the listings can be. So here you have two branches of a family um, and, and a richer uh, picture. In, and in this tree, what I've done is I have compared this branch to the branch as found in the 1807 census and put in the, the data in full. So all the um, information here in green uh, are additions from the 1807 census. So we have gained some members who were not in the branch as depicted by the Libro d'Oro. Um, and this is for several reasons. Of course, women were excluded. Um, and we had some, we have some children here who weren't born in 1803 when their father registered. But I think the most interesting here is the absence of the son Gerasimo, 
who you would think should be registered alongside his sons Saviano and Anastasio. Um, and we can only speculate why this is quite common to find a missing son of, a, of an eligible age in the catalogue. And it's presumably because there was a kind of, uh, there was perhaps a discrepancy or a difference in the social position of one branch of the family compared to another. Um, and that would be information that would require um, uh, further, further digging. So um, another thing that's insightful here, I think of the ages. So um, the children at the bottom here are uh, in many cases very young, uh, one years, about one year old and probably just a few months when they were registered in the Liberadoro. So you can see the kind of uh, fervor of the new nobles to register their sons so that they would become eligible to vote in 25 years, um, even though they were just a few months old when they had been registered. So to contextualize these names and to give the administrative register some more meaning, we need to consider the society into which the 1803 Liberadoro was born. As an administrative practice, the use of the title Liberadoro is, is significant in itself, because until now, and while we're in the last stages of the Ionian nobility, we are seeing the official adoption of what had primarily been a label applied by a tradition to the defensive regulatory practices of the old nobility, uh, excepting some examples of the late uh, Venetian period when the title is used by uh, official administrators. Here in the 1803, uh, under the 1803 constitution, we have a closed book cataloging the new nobility in accordance with new rules, but labeled with that old title, which had for centuries formed part of the mythology of the nobility. So despite this apparent liberalizing character of the 1803 constitution, which offended the old nobles, this new bourgeois constitution remains um, in debt to this ancient um, legacy, which it exploits. And the frustration of the old nobles, their accusation that the new reforms had debased the nobility corresponds merely to the fact that the new rules were finally to admit the bourgeoisie who they had long sought to keep out. In this way, I think the um, um, Liberadoro, uh, the, along with the constitution of 1803 have have been located among the other uh, European bourgeois liberal movements of the age of revolution. And indeed the drafters had been influenced by the enlightenment. And these watercolors here by the Ionian artist, um, Gerasimo Pizzamano um, show, I think the, uh, an interesting social variety um, in uh, citizens of mostly the Southern Ionian, Dante, Capilonia and Ithaca, uh, many of whom uh, would have, would have um, been eligible uh, to join the new nobility. Uh, interestingly, the Liberadoro describes the, those listed not as nobili, nobles, but as patrizi, patricians, um, the word formerly used to describe the Venetian nobility um, we saw earlier. Um, and so it, it describes the families as patrizia familia, the patrician families. Um, but the text of the constitution itself describes them as nobili attivi e costituzionali, actual and constitutional nobles. And as it was in the Venetian period, the terminology remains mixed. Uh, and this must have corresponded to mixed attitudes about the status and character of the makeup of the nobility, um, owing to that tension between the old and the new. Um, so while the constitution of 1803 is fundamentally a bourgeois reform, attempting to move power from the old closed nobility to a new constitutional nobility defined along bourgeois lines, it's still dependent on the language of this old, um, of the old regime and its Venetian heritage. Uh, so what were these um, members of the 1803 um, lists? Similarly uh, to the Venetian period, um, they formed a political body. So the men registered in the Liberadoro of each island formed the Sinquito Governativo of the island, its governing senate or council. And they were listed together with a governor um, of the island who was had to be appointed under the constitution from another island um, as a protection against corruption. And so for the first time, the Ithacan higher stratum had its own local representative body. Um, and 
we have to recall that there was no Ithacan council in the Venetian period. So this was novel for the small islands of Ithaca and Paxos in particular. So the Sinclito had a, an electoral function. Um, in proportion to its population, Ithaca um, elected just two members of the Corpo Legislativo in Corfu um, and one member of the Senate. Um, and the Senate had 17 members in total. So owing to its small population, Ithaca had a very small representation. So after the islands came under British protection, the conservative and centralizing constitution adopted in 1817 maintained the simplicity of each island as the electoral body. And no doubt many of the sons listed in the 1803 Libro d'Oro had finally come of age. Um, or in the, in the following period. I think I'd like to end with the reflections of the British, some of which we have already seen, um, which give a new colonial perspective to another slowly dying, slowly dying cons, uh, colonial institution in the form of the ex-Venetian nobility. The British certainly saw the upper classes on the islands as a risk, and the conflict of the local classes contributed to the disruption of the centralized British administration. To add to the British commentators I have already lent on, uh, the comments of Tertius Kendrick are an insightful place to end. He writes, playing the enlightened colonist, the nobility and gentry of the Ionian Islands require a firm-minded governor to keep them from manifesting those dangerous principles so destructive to small states in general. Indeed, the British view of the Ionian, Ionian nobility was small. Kendrick recalls how in Kefalonia in 1817, when the British restored the Libro d'Oro along the lines of the 1803 constitution, there was a contest to register on the list. He writes, I quote, Argostoli was in high ferment on the occasion. Son nobile io, lei non è. I am a noble, he is not, were the words that flew from mouth to mouth. Dirty, half-starved men made their appearance on a sudden to claim the right of hereditary honors. One gentleman, an advocate, observed to me with an air of great chagrin, non sono nobile, ma sono ricco. I'm not a noble, but I'm rich. His feelings, it seems, were hurt not so much on account of the rank itself, but because it prevented him from becoming a senator, to which rank he conceives his money and abilities entitle him. I purchased some wine at Lixuri, and it was a count who served me with his own hands, displaying as much dexterity as any dealer in the business. From this, the reader will gather some notion of the Kefalonite count. Thanks very much for that uh, seminar, Kiriako. It was uh, a wonderful understanding of the Libro d'Oro and uh, some of the amazing facets it has and uh, also the wonderful genealogies that we can use if uh, one was uh, to have a look at their family background. Of course, we've got uh, this wonderful book and uh, Ithacan Historical Society has access to a few copies. So if you ever want to have a look at it, uh, please contact us and we can uh, help you out uh, into looking at these two in this book. So does uh, anyone have any questions? Uh, we'd love to open it up to the floor. And uh, if anyone would like to uh, ask either on YouTube or Zoom, uh, please go ahead and put your books in uh, it's your questions in the uh, chat chat sessions. One question I'd like to ask uh, Idiako before uh, we have some come through is um, while the liberal daughter does not list women, what does it tell us about the status of women in Venetian and post Venetian Ionian society? Um, thanks, Peter. Um... And so, sorry for the technical um, malfunctions um, halfway through the presentation. Um, I think that the point about women is really important um, because it seems that you can kind of ignore, or it might seem at first that you can ignore the role of women um, because of their absence from the catalogue. But I think their absence um, and the regulatory processes passed in, in 1803 tell us a lot about um, a shifting the shifting position of women in the constitution of the new nobility um, because uh, in Venice uh, proper um, in the 16th century so in 1506 the 
um, decree was passed which required the registration of noble births and in 1526 a decree was passed for the registration of noble marriages that was the beginning of the Venetian libro d'oro um, administrative um, practices but those um, registrations also encompassed women by the fact that that noble marriages were um, inspected and that a noble births um, had to be um, legitimate births, of course, but legitimate births to noble um, to a noble father and a noble mother. So what that meant is that the registration of the nobility, while it formally might have appeared as the registration of a male uh, political class, really also had its um, had within its scope the registration of um, women as well. Um, and, and a similar situation in the Venetian period in the Ionian Islands, where um, the so-called uh, three grades of civility, the tre gradi di civiltà, um, included the inspection of the nobility of the um, noble mother um, of, um, a, of a hopeful member of the council. Now, the interesting thing about the 1803 constitution is there is this balance between this uh, individualizing theme and this this so this individualizing bourgeois theme and the old heritage um, and one of the reforms is that there is no longer um, a, an inspection of the status of the mother so um, a noble birth um, had to be legitimate but it didn't um, uh, it, one of the criteria um, which have to be passed was not that a mother was noble. Uh, so the father, um, the, the only criterion that had to be passed was non-ancestral, in other words. The only criterion was the income um, criterion which we saw, and there was no requirement other than the legitimacy of the father and the mother's marriage and the birth. Um, the, the mother had ceased then to be um, under the watch of the administration. Um, so I think that's an interesting, uh, I think it's an interesting shift. Um, and perhaps, perhaps what might be seen as um, part of its, its liberalizing theme um, in opposition to its, um, the, the, uh, the heritage which it, with which it was balanced. Excellent. Thanks very much, Kiriakou. Uh, a question from Andrew Raftopoulos, please. Um, hi, Kiriakou. I just, um, I was interested to see some of the listings of the family names. And um, <clears throat> I was wondering whether, you know, the origins of those, because, you know, translated into Italian, very similar to the Greek. And I kind of wondered um, how they evolved in, in, you know, did they evolve through Italian or, or Venetian influence or were they, in other words, were they Italian names Greekified or Greek names Italianized? Um, um, is there any sort of hint of that? Of how that, how the, where the origins of, you know, how they've evolved over those uh, centuries of occupation by Venice? Um, I'm just, I just opened the the book so I can have a look at the list of names. Um, I think the this is an interesting question because it will it usually reveals um, perhaps a closer or further more distant um, uh, non Greek heritage. Um, so, in many cases, these names are simply Greek um, in linguistic origin, um, and in many cases they're not. So, um, I'm, I'm just looking at the catalogue now and. There are some names which are of clear Italian origin, um, De La Decima, um, Domenicos, um, Mozzenigos, which is a noble, um, mm. a noble Venetian name. In any case, I think that's because the, the governor at the time was um, a Mozzenigo. Um, but um, the Ithacan Libro Daughter of 1803 is pretty late. So by this period, you ceased to be, I think, in that period of great transition or settlement where the, the uh, integration with the empire meant that you had the movement of populations um, which might make their, their might make settlement on the island and, and remain. Um, 
really what we're talking about are uh, they would be Greek speaking uh, Orthodox Christians um, with the exception of perhaps a very few um, there there is the family there's a family listed in the catalog um, with the name Salamon now that is interesting um, that is the, the the family Solomos uh, you know whence the the great poet uh, the Onisio Solomos, um, who, for, for example, signed his own name, uh, Dionisio Salamon, always in Italian. Um, now, it, what, so it wasn't contradictory to these Ionians of the upper classes um, to have a dual, a dual identity, to have a dual name. Um, did that, if the question goes to a, self, a question of self-identification, uh, I think that, um, that there tends to be uh, an allegiance according to class, um, particularly among the older nobles and the, the, the um, Salomon are, are certainly old nobles. For the rest of them, it, for the rest of the registrants in Ithaca, um, they would almost certainly be Greek speaking um, for several centuries. And I would be skeptical of, the idea that the Italian language, for example, would have been spoken by many more than the um, administrative class and perhaps the most educated who might have been sent abroad. Um, I doubt that they, I don't think that there would have been widespread use of the um, Italian language among the, what, a, what is the upper classes of the other islands. I doubt that that would have been replicated on Ithaca because of the fact that the, in the Venetian period at least, you didn't have those formal class um, distinctions. It's only with this new catalog. Um, now, I don't, I don't think I've given you a, an answer to your question no. um, because you asked about origins. I think that I think uh, isn't really an indi- that's not given any indication really by this catalog um, because the names written in Italian merely gives you the Italian uh, transcription of a Greek name. Um, and in many cases, if there is a close um, or if there is an equivalent Italian name or that if indeed the name is an Italian origin, it may seem more Italian than not. Um, but we have to be careful not to read into um, the name a, a history or an origin, um, which requires another um, historical investigation. Thanks very much for that, Kiriako. Appreciate you uh, elaborating on that. And obviously, a lot of those names are a bit of a, a mashup of both Italian and Greek and uh, origin. So, uh, and that's probably a, a, a seminar in itself uh, at a later date. So, um, um, we, we've gone just a little over an hour. So, I th- think we might uh, draw this to to a close. Um, there is uh, maybe if we could just fit in just one quick question about um, the reasons why um, the Ionian society pledges his allegiance to the British protectorate instead of the uh, Corfu. If you could just elaborate just briefly on that, and then we could uh, end on that little thing. Yeah, I, I can't remember how much detail I went into that. I think I mentioned the um, fact that the uh, government of, I think it was Nicolas Vretos at the time in, um, in the period under the old constitution of 1800, um, it was that they were having... A, a, an administrative drama where they really couldn't um, exercise the power of the Republic um, delegated to this local administration on the, um, on the island. And the um, social unrest in Ithaca was at a lower level than it was in the other islands in, in Dante and, and, and Catalonia. It was, it was um, violent in case in, in certain instances, um, there were uprisings um, at Lixuri and, and Argostoli. Um, and even in Corfu, you had the um, declaration of a, of a separatist council. Um, and so the classic example is that one of, of uh, Dante, where you have the, um, the uh, bourgeois class of the town of Dante pledging their allegiance to the British. Um, and Dante has this unusual um, uh, distinctiveness where it, it was always it always had these pro-Venetian sympathies among the the bourgeois class uh, because of the current trade. So um, the current trade was 
um, kind of a mixed basket for the Venetians because uh, they felt that they weren't, uh, they were being um, gypped by the fact that uh, foreign merchants, English ships major in, in the majority, were coming to um, the island and trading directly with Venetian subjects. And the role of the state was kind of uh, circumvented. So the ordinary Venetian model would be to uh, take commodities, bring them to Venice, they would be stored in large, huge uh, warehouses and then distributed through the empire, uh, through the apparatus. And uh, direct trade between islanders and the, and the British um, was seen as a threat to the system. And so the Venetians imposed a tax, for example, and tried to stop it. And um, the, the class that's most affected and most outraged by this is, the, is this um, upward, um, upwardly mobile uh, bourgeois class. And they're the ones who are locked out of the council. Um, and Dante is, a, is the perfect example of the closed council where um, there's a set amount of members, that's it, you're never going to get in. And so you have these boiling um, uh, angers bet between the bourgeois and the noble class, which spill over in, 18, in 1800, 1801. Um, and um, I think now when we apply that to Ithaca, why then would the Vafi residents have been um, going in that direction and the... Um, that there is only a threat to raise the Union Jack. They don't actually raise the Union Jack in Ithaca. Um, I think it would be, uh, it would have to be that the residents of Athi would have been part of this um, increasingly mercantile class who were making money on the seas, trading, um, and uh, they're another example of an Ionian class which doesn't really have a political representation under the Venetian period. Um, and so they, like that quote, I think at the very end, in a different period, that they, they feel um, that their money entitles them to something that legally they aren't entitled to. And so I think that that is why um, they wanted to raise the Union Jack and request the protection of the British. Um, and then uh, when the British eventually come uh, for the British and that they establish the United States of the Ionian Islands, um, that class eventually becomes uh, not loyal subjects, but becomes a problem um, for the British rulers. Um, so I think it's a really good example of, the, of how Ithaca kind of manifests similar class um, uh, tensions to those larger islands. Excellent, thanks very much, Kiriyoko. Really appreciate you uh, deliberating on those questions. Uh, it was uh, a really wonderful presentation. Um, thank you. The present, thank you. And uh, so this presentation will be on YouTube. You'll be able to uh, review it and uh, have a, uh, and stop it where, where you'd like to um, and uh, give yourself a bit of time to digest some of the uh, finer points of Kiriakwa's seminar. Uh, we look forward to uh, the next uh, seminar, which will be held um, during November. And that's, uh, we'll be looking forward to a discussion by uh, Dr. Romina Sakiri, who will be speaking on the Brigandy and piracy in 17th century Ithaca. So that's coming up next in November. So we really look forward to um, Romina giving that uh, presentation next month. In the meantime, uh, you can uh, contact the Ithacan Historical Society. We uh, always have, uh, we've have future events um, in place that we look forward to. And uh, we're, we're a working group that looks uh, at the historical documenting of our uh, history, uh, photographs throughout uh, uh, going back uh, uh, this century and also uh, working backwards. So look forward to um, uh, engaging with you over the next uh, few months.